Welcome to Beneath the Bible, where we're helping you dig deeper and uncover the world beneath the sacred book. Today is the end of our Exodus series and the finale of season two. We've followed Israel from forced labor in Egypt through the 10 plagues and across the sea. Today, we pick up with Israel entering the promised land. Now, I know we've skipped 40 years of excitement in between, but we did this because the settlement of Israel is a bit of a hot topic in the world of archeology. span we have the biblical account of this period in Joshua and Judges, but we also have extensive archeological evidence from this region and time period. When we look at the two, text and archeology, span they don't always seem to line up. So what do we make of this? Is the Bible wrong? Have all the archeologists messed us up? We're gonna dive deep into those questions and look at how different archeologists and scholars have made sense of this time period. We'll review what the text tells us, then look at what archaeology shows us, and finally review the main models that try to make sense of it all. In the Bible, the books of Joshua and Judges give us the Israelites' understanding of how they came into their promised land. Joshua presents a picture of a cohesive and organized campaign that crosses the Jordan River, takes Jericho, and conquers the Canaanite cities in the south and then the north. It lists the cities and the kings whom the Israelites conquered. It gives the itinerary of the campaigns. And scholars have noted that chapters nine to 12 even read like a typical second millennium conquest narrative, similar to other ancient Near Eastern accounts that we have. But judges and even parts of Joshua hint that the conquest described in Joshua wasn't complete. Significant areas of the land were not taken and the local population of Canaanites persisted. So when we look at the biblical text, we see a conquest narrative with a recognition that the conquest wasn't finished. When we look at what we see archeologically, the picture becomes even more complex. Israel emerges as an archeological entity in the Iron Age one. We have a whole video reviewing this period you can watch here. So we won't review this whole period and we'll just highlight what's important for today. During this period, the highlands of Canaan saw an influx of new settlements. Hundreds of small agricultural villages popped up in a relatively short period of time. This is a highly concentrated influx that we don't see elsewhere, even in adjacent areas with a similar material culture like the Shvela and the Negev. The shared material culture of these settlements means that archaeologists can tie them together. This means that they use similar pottery, for example, which may seem like not much, but it points to things like a shared diet. And if everyone is using the same kind of dishes, they're probably making the same kind of food. The emergence of a distinctly Israelite material culture during this time period points to Israel's differentiation of itself from its neighbors. These settlements demonstrate a pork taboo, for example, with almost zero pork bones, um, pork bones among their remains. Another marker of these new settlements is that they completely avoid the elegant Philistine pottery that we see in neighboring Philistine and even Canaanite sites. These sites don't use decorated pottery at all, really. They practiced simple inhumation burials. They even had a similar house form and structure. In short, these new settlements seem to have a lot in common and scholars have long identified these new settlements as Israelite. But while there were new settlements established during this period, there were also some settlements that didn't survive the Bronze Age, Iron Age transition. Hatzor was burned, Bethel was burned, others like Bet Shemesh, Timna, Telbait Mersim were all destroyed. Some of these sites had new settlements built on top that have Israelite material. And that, Israelite and that Israelite pottery that they shared isn't really distinct from Canaanite pottery. It continues the Canaanite traditions of the Bronze Age, but with a smaller amount of forms and types. Settlements are also concentrated in the highlands, and the lowlands seem to have fewer settlements in them. This is a really quite significant change from the Bronze Age when the highlands, or the late Bronze Age, when the highlands were largely depopulated. So, this is the archeological signature we have of the emergence of a people called Israel in the highlands of Canaan at the start of the Iron Age. What can archeology span tell us about how the land was settled? We're gonna look at several different, several different models that scholars have proposed for how this settlement took place. The first model which was put forward by archeologists is the so-called conquest model. This was championed by William F. Albright, a pioneer in Syro-Palestinian archeology, span as well as such figures as the Israeli general and archeologist Yigal Yadin. This essentially sees the account in Joshua as more or less historically accurate. The Israelites moved into the land as a military force and conquered it. This is supported by all the destroyed sites we see, particularly Hatzor, whose destruction is described in Joshua 11. 
The problem with this model is that even if all these sites have destruction layers, it doesn't mean they were all destroyed at the same time. The date of Hatsor destruction has been questioned, and other sites may have been destroyed at close to the same time, but archaeologically it's impossible to tell if they were destroyed a day apart or a decade or more apart. So while these destructions support the straightforward reading of Joshua, the reality isn't so simple. While the sites we've listed have destruction layers, many others have no destruction. Many sites did survive the Bronze Age Iron Age horizon and continued with a purely Canaanite cultural tradition rather than the new and distinctive Israelite cultural tradition. The next model is known as the Peaceful Infiltration Model. This model was proposed by a German scholar named Albrecht Alt. This suggests that the Israelites did not conquer the land but moved in from across the Jordan as a peaceful wave of migrants who filled the demographic void of the highlands. This model posits that the site destructions that we see during the period are quite minimal and can be explained as intercity conflict amongst the Canaanites. We know these kinds of conflicts happened among Canaanite city-states, so there's no need to attribute it to an organized army of Israelites. In fact, the Israelites have a lot in common with the Canaanites, adopting large parts of their culture as they gradually infiltrated into the highlands and moved from a nomadic or semi-nomadic life to a more stationary agricultural lifestyle. This helps to explain the numerous new, apparently peaceful settlements in the highlands. This model has been revived and reworked in recent times, notably by Israel Finkelstein in his 1988 monograph, The Archaeology of the Israelite Settlement. His work drew more on the long-term demographic processes we see in the highlands, moving from being depopulated to having a larger population. He sees the Israelites as part of this longer-term process of peacefully settling in the highlands after a period of depopulation. There's a lot of merit to this model, which is why it keeps getting revamped and given new life as the years go on. You can even see it under new names like the Pastoral Canaanite model and, and several others. However, it doesn't sufficiently explain all of our data as there are certainly destructions and violence associated with the early Iron Age. The archaeology shows us that the infiltration of the highlands during this period wasn't entirely peaceful. This model also goes by several different names. It's sometimes called the sociological model, as we call it here. And this model posits that the late Bronze Age city-state system exploited the lower classes to enri enrich the elites. We do in fact see a well-developed luxury trade and elite culture that flourished in the late, late Bronze Age. And this model attributed to George Mendenhall suggests that the exploited urban peasants rose up and revolted against their Canaanite overlords and retreated into the highlands for a more idyllic rural agrarian lifestyle, free of the bourgeoisie overlords. This would explain both the destroyed Canaanite urban centers and the similarities between Israelite and Canaanite culture. While this model may explain some things in theory, there's no direct evidence of any such revolt. Also, you can probably tell from the language used in the model, it is inspired by Marxist ideology, specifically that of class conflict. And in a somewhat ironic twist, this Marxist theory is sometimes called the revolting peasants model of settlement. While the overlay of Marxist ideology on this model doesn't make it wrong per se, it's important to realize that this model starts with a predetermined framework and fits the archaeological evidence into that framework, rather than uh, allowing the archaeological evidence to guide the formulation of the model. Yet another model has been offered by an Israeli archaeologist named Shlomo Bunimovitz. His model is, some, is in some ways built off of Finkelstein's model. Both Finkelstein and Budenmovitz focus on long-term demographic shifts between the highlands and lowlands. Budenmovitz focuses on the long-term processes and calls it a shifting frontier. He argues that the highlands were the frontier, a marginal area in the Late Bronze Age after being a highly populated uh, area in the preceding Middle Bronze Age. In the Iron One, nomads and other Late Bronze Age inhabitants of the lowlands moved into the highlands, and the frontier shifted. His model is very similar to Finkelstein's in that it takes a long-term perspective or a long durée perspective on the demographic trends in the Southern Levant and recognizes the role of sedentarizing nomads in the highlands. His role is just a part of this long-term process. This model differ differs largely just in what it focuses on, long-term trends. And this is admittedly some something Finkelstein does an excellent job highlighting in his own model, but Mudenovitz focuses on these trends and sees the Iron One settlement as part of this long-term cycle of shifting frontiers. This model works well, but is perhaps a bit more descriptive than explanatory. A relatively recent model has been suggested by Anne Killebrew. She discusses it in her book, Biblical Peoples and Ethnicity, and we'll put the details in the description below. I really like this model, because it not only recognizes the messiness of the data we have, but it's strengthened by the data, something that can't always be said about other models. 
Her model uses what we know from cultural anthropology and identity formation and recognizes this is a messy process. The group that became the Israelites may have been a motley crew in the early Iron Age. Could it have included disaffected urban Canaanite peasants seek seeking a new life? Sure. Could it have included nomadic or semi-nomadic people settling down for a new agrarian lifestyle? Sure. Could it have included an exodus group of Asiatic peoples who left forced labor in Egypt and settled in the highlands? Sure. All of this is possible given what we know of the time period, and there's evidence for this mixed multitude in the biblical text itself. In Joshua, the Gibeonites are non-Israelites who are incorporated into the Israelite community. Rahab and her family are residents of Jericho and are spared the, and join the Israelites. The text of Joshua makes it clear that the land wasn't fully depopulated, and the archaeology certainly makes it look like this was a mixed group. What unified them was a shared sense of identity, an identity focused on their relationship with their God. What this mixed group had in common was an ideology that centered around the worship of Yahweh. They had a special relationship with a God who revealed himself to the Exodus group in the desert. This is what made them Israelites, and this, even more than the material culture, is what distinguished them from their neighbors. In trying to unravel the process by which the Israelites moved into the highlands of Canaan, we see that the archaeology and even the text itself complicate the straightforward reading that we're used to. Now, this doesn't mean that the biblical account is wrong or untrustworthy. It just means that as modern readers, we have some work to do to piece together the text we've received and the evidence that we've uncovered. Rather than destroying our faith in the text, this process can actually help us understand it better and read it more faithfully. Now, while none of the models we've examined today fully explains the complicated process by which the Israelites entered the highlands, each contributes something to our understanding of the geographical and socio-political process of the Israelites settling the land. For example, while the conquest model has been shown to be lacking in historical and archaeological evidence, it does give us insight into something equally important. From this model, as well as the biblical text, we see the way the Israelites understood their conquest of the land and told their history. As modern readers, we see that this model is not strictly historical, but it gives us insight into why the Israelites wrote their history the way they did. They lived in a land that they knew had been occupied before them, and they told their history in a way that explained their present situation. Why and how were these places destroyed? Why do we belong in this land now when others were here before us? And how is this land a sign of God's presence with us? Other models help us understand the historical and the archaeological reality behind this settlement process. We see that the settlement process wasn't entirely peaceful, but it also wasn't entirely violent. The entry of the Israelites into the land was a process of cultural genesis and assimilation as much as it was a military campaign. Some of the people groups already living in the highlands of Canaan were incorporated over generations into the people called Israel. The Israelites' unique cultural identity set them apart from the people around them, and perhaps even appealed to those on the margins of the Canaanite city-states. And because all of each of these models contributes something to our understanding of the settlement process, something like the mixed multitude model makes a lot of sense. It's a model that embraces the complexity of the actual settlement process, and accounts for the various sources that give us the whole picture of that process. First of all, we see what was recorded in the Bible, the way the Israelites chose to tell their origin story. Next is what wasn't recorded, the details that aren't present in the biblical text, both historically and sociologically, but that give us a more complete picture of how the Israelites came into the land. And finally, there's what was actually happening, what archaeologists and historians can piece together from the evidence available today. Now, in a way, this combination of models is exactly what we want to do here at Beneath the Bible, giving you insight into the biblical text as well as the history, sociology, and archaeology that can help you read the Bible better. As we conclude our Exodus series with this video, we hope that that's what we've been able to do for you over these last few weeks. And that's a wrap on Season 2 of Beneath the Bible. Thanks for joining us this season, for all the support you've given us, and the great questions you've asked, and the challenges you've posed. And we've got some cool stuff about the Minor Prophets coming your way over the summer, plus some great videos about ancient Near Eastern mythology to kick off Season 3 in the fall. 
we're going to take a few weeks off for now, so be sure you're subscribed so you know when we're back. As always, if you're interested in learning more about this topic, we've included some references and resources down in the description. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more content like it, in addition to subscribing, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Beneath the Bible. And if you learned something new today, take a minute to share this video with your friends. And until next time, keep digging.